Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third and final session of the Museums for the 21st Century webinar series. I'm Megan Hewitt, Executive Director of the American Institute for Indonesian Studies, and I am joined by the Museums for the 21st Century. Hello, Tracing everyone, Patterns and Foundation. welcome to the third and final Tracing Patterns Foundations and the Smithsonian Institution Asian Cultural History Program based in the US, as well as the Institute Conservasi and Museum Turia based in Indonesia. Museums for the 21st Century, which goes by the shorthand M21, brings together curators and scholars from the US and Indonesia who specialize in the future direction of museums in three areas, collection and exhibition and research, engagement with family and youth, and art conservation. The project began in December 2022 as a professional development program consisting of in-person workshops in three Indonesian institutions, including Museum Textil Jakarta, Museum Provinci Kalimantan Barat in Pontianak, and Museum Balanga in Provinci Kalimantan Tengah. This webinar series is designed to disseminate results from those in-person course modules conducted in December of last year, as well as address additional challenges faced by Indonesian museums for wider public audiences. The M21 program is made possible through generous funding by the US Embassy in Jakarta. This third session of the M21 webinar series is focused on the subject of curation. This session will address non-Western museum paradigms curatorial approaches, and concepts of cultural heritage preservation, which are inherent characteristics of indigenous curation. In addition, it will address various museological behaviors promoting indigenous curation and the vital involvement of cultural custodians in museums activities aimed at preserving and transmitting cultural heritage. We are pleased to offer simultaneous translation from English into Indonesian language for our Zoom audience today. Um, this will be provided by our talented interpreter, Anna Rahmawati. In order to select the Indonesian translation, please click on the interpretation tab located at the bottom of the Zoom window. You will need to choose Indonesian and then select mute original audio. This webinar is being live streamed on YouTube, and a recording will also be posted on Tracing Patterns YouTube channel after the event. We ask that all attendees please mute their audio during the presentations. The structure of the session will consist of 45 minutes of presentations by our two guest speakers, a 10 minute response from our moderators, followed by a Q&A session open to the audience. You are all welcome to input your questions in the chat uh, on Zoom at any time in either English or Indonesian language. We will also take questions from the YouTube live stream. When you are submitting questions, please note your home institution as well as the speaker to which you would like to address the question. Now it is my honor to invite our panelists for today. If I can please invite Christina, Anna, Sandra, and Rob to join me on the screen. Our, welcome everyone. <laughs> Our moderators for today's session are Robert Ponison and Sandra Sargiano. Robert Ponison is a senior fellow in the Asian Cultural History Program at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of National History in Washington, DC. A Japan Foundation Fellowship recipient in 2017, his research involves extensive fieldwork among artisan communities and centers on Asian traditional arts and crafts, the reproduction of craft skills and strategies for cultural heritage promotion and preservation. The co-author of four books, his recent publications include Endangered Craft Traditions and Museums, 
Lessons on Sustainability from Japan and the USA Kazakhstan par Partnership, published last year at the Central Asian Journal of Art Studies. Welcome, Rob. Our second moderator is Dr. Sandra Sarjono. She is the founder and president of the Tracing Patterns Foundation, a nonprofit organization that does research and promotes cultural heritage, particularly in the field of textiles. She earned her doctorate in art history from the University of California at Berkeley with a dissertation thesis entitled Tracing Patterns of Textiles in Ancient Java, 8th through 15th century. Prior to her PhD program, she worked as assistant curator of costumes and textiles at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and as textile conservator at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in New York. She is the project leader of the Museums for the 21st Century program. Welcome, Sandra. We're honored today to have not one, but two invited key speakers for our session on curation. Our first speaker will be Dr. Christina Cripps. Welcome, Christina. She is Professor of Anthropology, Director of Museum and Heritage Studies and Museum of Anthropology at the University of Denver, Colorado, USA. She has been studying musical, museological forms and practices from historical, cross-cultural, comparative, and international perspectives since the 1980s. Christina has focused on museum coloniality and decoloniality in the Netherlands and Republic of Indonesia, and also has been involved in museum development and heritage training programs in Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand and Europe, in addition to the United States. She is currently co-editor of the Rutledge series Museum Meanings with Richard Sandel of Leice Leicester University. Welcome, Christina. Our second guest speaker today is Dr. Anna Labrador, an honorary senior fellow of the School of Historical and Philo Philosophical Studies, Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. She is concurrently a member of the International Conservation Advisory Panel, National Heritage Board of Singapore, Conservation Advisor for the Central Visayas Museum Association based in Cebu City, and member of the External Advisory Board, Reconnect, Recollect, Reparative Connections to Philippine Collections at the University of Michigan. Dr. Labrador is a social anthropologist and museologist by training, having obtained her PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2000 and an MA in museum and gallery management from the City University of London in 1991. She is also a member of the International Council of Museums, Standing Committee for Museum Definition, and serves as secretary, secretary of the ICOM Asia Pacific Regional Alliance and we'll hold this post until 2025. Thank you and welcome, uh, Dr. Leverdal. Um, without further ado and introduction by me, uh, let me please invite our first speaker, Dr. Christina Cripps, to share your presentation on curation um, and welcome everyone to this, to this event today. Hey, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank Ibu Sandra Sardono for inviting me to participate in this um, very impressive seminar series and to all of the organizers and sponsors, as well as to all of the participants here today. Um, it, it is indeed a really profound honor and pleasure because of my long association with um, the Indonesian museum world. So Ibu Sandra asked me to talk about indigenous curation and museology in Indonesia. So based on my research at Museum Balonga, uh, so that is what my presentation will focus on. And by way of introduction, I want to tell you a story of how I came to do research in Indonesia and at Museum Balonga. And here it is back in 1992. 
So my journey to Indonesia actually began in the Netherlands um, back in 1987, when I went there to study Dutch anthropology museums and their approaches to the display and interpretation of non-Western cultures in colonial and post-colonial periods. Sorry, I Christina, I think you need to start, start your screen share. Oh, it didn't work. I'm very, very sorry. I apologize for that. Um, okay. Oh, that's very out of me. I really am sorry for that. Okay, here we go. Great. I, I apologize again. So, um, all right. Um, at the end of, I, I just, um, okay, I'll start over. So I was in the Netherlands in 1987 doing research in Dutch museums. And at the end of my research period there, I presented my findings at an ICOM conference in Leiden. Um, and in the audience were several representatives from Indonesia, including Dr. Anders Bambang Sumadio, who was then head of the Directorate of Museums in Jakarta. Pak Sumadio found my presentation very interesting and suggested that I come to Indonesia to see how the government was using museums for their own purposes and in a post-colonial context. So I made my first trip to Indonesia Museum Belanga in 1989, right after it was designated um, a provincial museum and placed under the administration of the National Museum System. Paxumadio suggested that Museum Balanga would be an ideal site for my study since it was, quote, a brand new museum located in a place where people had no idea what a museum is, end of quote. I later discovered that it was not brand new, but had been established in the 1970s by community leaders to collect and preserve the cultural heritage of central Kalimantan and particularly that of the Dayak people. So during this first visit, Pax Madio and directorate staff in Jakarta told me that Orang Indonesia, for the most part, were Bloom, museum-minded. And it was the job of the directorate to educate the people and about museums and make them museum-minded. I was intrigued by this um, this phrase, museum-minded and balloon, um, not only because museum-minded was in English, but also because it suggested that some people already were museum-minded and there was such a thing of being museum-minded. So I asked myself, well, what does it mean to be museum-minded and how does one become museum-minded? And these were central to my research um, in, as I proceeded uh, doing field work later in January, 1991, when I returned to Indonesia for an 18 month study of Museum Belanga. And over this study period, I carried out ethnographic research at the museum, which included interviewing staff, observing their daily activities, for example, how they collected and cared for collections, created exhibitions and educational programs, and worked with community members. I also attended administrative meetings and workshops, often organized and run by staff from Jakarta, um, from the directorate, and with in international museum experts. In addition to my research at Museum Belanga, I also spent a lot of time in Jakarta and other parts of Indonesia visiting museums and talking to staff. My aim was to get a general picture of national museum development and, and to see how Indonesian, Indonesian museums were similar and different from Western style museums. So over the course of my research, I learned that people in central Kalimantan and indeed in other parts of Indonesia were Suda, already museum minded, but in their own ways. They had their own culturally specific ways of taking care of and preserving their tangible and intangible cultural heritage and transmitting, transmitting it from one generation to the next. While the modern museum idea was new to many in central Kalimantan and elsewhere in Indonesia, curatorial and museological behavior 
or the collection and care and conservation, preservation and display of things that people valued had in a very long history. So now I'll show you some examples of indigenous curation or local museology. I observed in Museum Belonga back in the early 1990s, as well as indigenous models of museums and curation from elsewhere in Indonesia and Kalimantan. As I previously mentioned, while conducting research at Museum Belanga, I had the opportunity to observe museum staff plan and create exhibitions. This process also generally involved working with community members who were knowledgeable about various aspects of diet culture and many of the objects in the museum collection. I later realized that these individuals in many respects could be considered indigenous curators if we go back to the original meaning of the words. The words curator and curation are derived from the Latin word curare, which means to take care of, and was used in reference to the duties of uh, religious practitioners known as curates. Thus, curators have an ancient association with taking care and being curate caretakers. This association and its religious and spiritual dimensions became clear to me when I had the opportunity to work with museum staff on um, in the preparation of an exhibition on traditional wood carving in Kalimantan. The exhibition presented from the museum's collections of various objects, including wood, wooden figures known as hampatung and koruhe, originally made by ritual specialist or basir for use in Hindu kaharingan rituals and ceremonies. I learned that each object is a unique creation, uh, creation endowed with the meanings and powers known only to the basir that created it. Knowledge about hampatung and koruhe can be sacred, non-public, and only acquired through lengthy apprenticeship and it is also highly personal and based on individual interpretations of kaharingan. Because the objects were made for specific purposes and had very specific meanings, museum workers were cautious about writing general information about the objects. Out of respect for these traditional, traditional customs and beliefs associated with these objects and the related authority of the basir, museum belongers Belonga workers look to them for guidance on how to interpret and present the objects in exhibitions on kaharingan rituals. They call, also called on Prasir to assist them in the production of exhibitions, such as the Upachara Tiwa, which is an elaborate mortuary ceremony. So here are um, Here's a photograph of some of the uh, basir who helped the staff construct ceremonial structures such as the Sankaraya and Pasapali and selected objects for display like Sapundu, Hap Hapatung, and Karuha and arranged, their in their, arranged them in their appropriate positions within the exhibition. But here you see is uh, photographs of an actual Tiwa ceremony that I um, attended over a se several weeks. And um, the same kinds of structures that they were creating in the museum. On the right, the Pasapali and the Sankaraya. And here the Sapundu with the uh, sacrificial buffalo. And then a close up of the Sapundu, uh, the one on the left is at the Tiwa. And the one on the right is from an, uh, an old Tiwa site in a village. So at the end of the um, the um, completion of the exhibition, the basir uh, performed a cleansing ritual to cast out any bad spirits lingering or uh, residing in the objects and to summon good spirits to bless the museum staff and, vis and future visitors, as well as the museum environment in general. So by collaborating with basir, the museum was practicing its own form of culturally specific and context, uh, culturally sensitive and context specific museology that honored local traditions and helped sustain them. Collaboration with Basir was one example of how Museum Malanga was a, a, a place or a site for cultural hybridization or the mixing of local um, 
museology and museum culture with the museum culture of the wider professional museum world. So earlier I noted that uh, Basir and other cultural experts could be seen as curators if we think of the original meaning of curator as caretaker. But as I observed, the roles they play played and the task they performed in Museum Belanga was not far from the contemporary professional idea of a curator and curation. Similar to professional curators, Basir possessed specialized knowledge acquired after a long period of apprenticeship and used this knowledge to interpret objects in the museum collections for general audiences. Also like contemporary cu curators elsewhere, their work extends beyond just taking care of collections. In addition to collecting, researching, managing, and interpreting collections, many of today's curators are also deeply engaged in community work and see it as a form of social service. This kind of cross-cultural comparison of curators and curation is an example of comparative museology, which is an approach or research methodology that grew out of my original research at Museum Belanga and um, has guided my study of museums in many different uh, countries and cultural contexts over the past decades. So this is a very text heavy <laughs> um, uh, slide the, in which I um, describe what uh, comparative museology is to me, and it, it's concerned with identifying, documenting, and critically analyzing similarities and differences in museological forms and behaviors, as well as examples of mixing of museological editions from different cultural and national contexts and from cross-cultural and comparative perspectives. It helps us understand how people from diverse cultural contexts know, experience, care for, and protect what they value, as well as their particular ways of being in relationship with their material and immaterial worlds. It sheds lights on our own practices so we can see them in new and different ways, and how what is considered appropriate or so-called best practice in one time and place may not be so in others. It provides lessons in how to improve practices and develop more culturally sensitive and appropriate approaches in, um, to the care and preservation of tangible and intangible cultural heritage and shows that there's not one standard universal museum model or museology, but a world full of museologies. So in this slide is um, a definition of the basic uh, components of indigenous curation and museological forms and behaviors. And so um, I propose that comparative museology also helps us identify these in places we might not always expect to find them. For example, in vernacular architecture, religious ceremonies and practices, as I just showed you with the, um, the um, cura curatorial work of the Basir, in social organizations, especially kinship systems and ancestor worship, artistic traditions and aesthetic canons, knowledge of art and relationships to people's natural environment, and then conceptual frameworks and social practices that set Trans, um, support the transmission of culture through time, which is basically a definition of cultural heritage preservation. So they, um, so one example of one concept, of one Indonesian concept of um, cultural heritage preservation is pusaka, and um, and that it has worked to this concept has worked to protect and preserve valuable cultural property and transmit cultural knowledge and traditions through the generations. So I know many of you already know what Prusaka is and I don't really need to elaborate, but um, here is a definition that I took from the book, Prusaka, the Art of Indonesia from the National Museum. And that um, I'm not going to read it um, to for the sake of time, but uh, it is something that um, in inherited that there is analogous uh, 
to the English word inheritance and as an heirloom, that's something passed down through the generations. So tangible forms of pusaka can include textiles, jewelry, ornaments, weapons, ceramics and beads, land, ancestor figures, and houses. Intangible pusaka can be songs and dances and, and um, oratory, a or symbol or a name. Visual, um, virtually anything can become pusaka, although not everything that is inherited is pusaka, nor are objects created to be to be pusaka. Um, it becomes pusaka in the course of its social life. As the Indonesian curator and anthropologist um, Suwati Kartiwa um, explains, pusaka are social constructs or ideas, and it's the meaning a society gives these objects, not anything innate in the objects themselves, which make them pusaka. So, uh, because it is a social construct, she states it's more appropriate to think of it in terms of social relationships because Pusaka emphasize, express, and define relationships within society. In some places, Pusaka is under the care and protection of ritual specialists, leaders of customary law, or royal functionaries who act as Pusaka curators. In the royal courts of Java, for instance, the curators of royal heirlooms are known as Abdi Dalem, who are responsible for safeguarding the physical and spiritual properties of the heirlooms, in addition to passing knowledge about um, them on to younger generations. So today, rights to the ownership of Pusaka may be transferred to a public museum in which Pusaka becomes the heritage and cultural property, not of an individual or family, but of a community, a province, or the nation. Thus, museums could be seen in this respect as a house for Pusaka. So a particularly important form of Pusaka among Dayaks are these large Chinese uh, jars called Balanga, from which the name, uh, uh, from which the museum takes its name? And as many of you know, Balanga have had played a long, long have played a central role in Dayak economic, religious, and social systems, and have been integrated into rituals and ceremonial life. They've been used in daily life to store rice and other staples and brew rice wine for ceremonies and rituals, and in the past as burial urns. Above all, they've been symbols of status and wealth. And the, the most precious jars are those handed down as family heirlooms. A treasured pusaka, as treasured pusaka, they've also been treated with ceremony and great respect. So the Dayak skill at collecting and trading Belanga is well documented in um, the ethnographic literature. Several authors have written about how certain Dayak groups were particularly adept at trading and having jar experts or even connoisseurs who were knowledgeable about um, various types and values of jars and um, knew how to identify whether one was uh, authentic, uh, what its provenance was, dating qualities of their glaze and form, and other criteria that determined value, uh, very much like a, a connoisseur or curator. In addition to economic and aesthetic value, jars have been held in spiritual um, and religious, have been valued for their spiritual and religious significance as well as their supernatural powers and agency in uh, being able to uh, 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 make things happen or transform themselves. So one author no, uh, wrote that in the 1980s, few jar experts still existed in Malaysia and Borneo. But actually, in uh, my work, during my field work, I discovered this was not um, the case at all. In visits to villages and in people's homes, I saw large collections of jars, and they were part of every religious ceremony I attended, as well as weddings and funerals. And jars were still being used to settle community grievances according to customary law or a dot, and were also part of a bride's dowry. I also encountered several injured 
individuals who knew a great deal about jars, including their classification and customs dictating their uses, how to repair them, and their, their associated stories and legends. One individual told me that in order to become a jar export expert, one had to burguru or apprentice and pay for this specialized knowledge. Okay, so much attention has been given to the care and protection or curation of Alanga. Like other forms of Osaka, they're usually carefully stored in specially designated areas within houses or only brought out at special times like weddings or funerals. They may also be stored in a family community's family or community's rice barn, barn or lumbung, which can be seen as an indigenous model of a museum. The Lumbung is similar to a museum in the sense that it functions as a storehouse for valuables that include not only uh, rice, but also cherished heirlooms such as gongs, ceramics, and ritual objects. Due to their preciousness, the preciousness of their contents, Lumbung are also considered sacred and uh, spaces and likened to temples and shrines in their design, architectural features, and hallowed nature. Evidence of the cultural significance of Lumbung throughout time is seen in this bas relief at the base of the famous Borobudur Temple in central Java. Some rice barns are, are elaborately decorated structures like these Daraja rice barns. Um, and I was introduced to the idea of the Lombong as an um, indigenous model of museum in this village in East Kalimantan by that, that man on the left, who was the one that suggested that um, the Lombong was similar to uh, a museum. And I visited this village in 1996. The rice, the rice barn here is akin to a lumbung in that it is designed with conservation in mind, as well as just being uh, not only just being a space to conserve things, but actually uh, showing evidence of conservation measures, such as the um, latched um, thatched roofing and movable awnings that you can see. Um, and vents that are used to control the interior temperature and airflow, which of course is very important in the climate, um, the hot and humid climate of Borneo. And um, also, it's this airflow is important to um, check um, our retard growth and um, mildew. For this purpose, I learned that charcoal is also placed inside the um, Lumbugs at, at times as a dehumidifier. And the interior can also be fumigated with the smoke of smoldering uh, red peppers, which are known to contain antibacterial and antifungal agents. So the rice barn in feature, uh, also in feature, features these ingenious, what I think are ingenious pest control measures, which are these curved planks at the top of the piles. Um, and so that um, if mice or other rodents try, try to enter, they can't. Um, so it was um, these features that I found particularly um, impressive as indigenous conservation practices. So certainly we can see how museums like Museum Balanga have taken over some of the functions of traditional Pusaka keeping places and the roles of um, traditional caretakers. And despite their placement in museums, Pusaka objects like Balanga may still be revered by community members or families who may come to visit them from time to time and make offerings to them. In this case, we see again, this mixing of the local and the old and the new in um, a particular uh, uh, contemporary museum context. So as I have argued for a very long time now, uh, indigenous curatorial practices approaches to, and approaches to heritage preservation are not only examples of world museological diversity, but also world cultural diversity. And as such, they are valuable cultural expressions worthy of preservation in their own right as part of people's heritage and identity. 
for the promotion and preservation of museological diversity, I have proposed this idea of appropriate museology or the development of museum practices that are adapted to specific cultural, social, and economic settings, building on people's own museological traditions and mixing them with professional museum methods. This is a means of making museums more suitable to local conditions and thus more sustainable in the long run by better integrating them into local society and involving community members. So in conclusion, um, appropriate museology, I suggest, um, can be a means of keeping local indigenous museologies alive. And that is, um, in my opinion, the point of cultural heritage preservation. So Tori Mikasi, and I'm just showing these slides that if you're interested in um, reading more about these um, this, these practices and um, my research over the years, these are two books available um, online. So again, thank you for listening. And I shall now turn it over to Dr. Ana Maria Labrador, um, who is our next presenter. Thank you. Unmute myself. Okay. I would like to thank the organizers of this um, meeting. Um, thank you for, for inviting me here. And um, also to Sandra, who's been uh, very good at uh, following up all the requirements and, and all that. And uh, also, it's, it's a, a true honor to be presenting the curation part of M21 with um, Christina Krebs. So I uh, really admired her work from the very beginning. So I will now share my, my screen and begin my discussion. <clears throat> Just to make sure that I put down my PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, so this presentation will provide an overview of the curatorial processes in planning and installing exhibitions pertaining to the Bangsamoro communities. Um, this uh, particular exhibition, um, the Faith, Tradition, and Place, Pangsamoro Art from the National Ethnographic Collection took place at, uh, when I was still a, uh, uh, a director, a deputy director at the National Museum of the Philippines. So this took place at the National Museum of Anthropology in Manila and which was inaugurated in October, 2014. Before this, I will introduce issues on the cultural complexity of the Bangsamoro that inform the conceptual understanding of the collections selected for the exhibition. Later, I will provide a discussion on designing a program for equity and access that recontextualizes the material culture that will be put on display. Eventually, as I'm proposing in this lecture, Marginalized communities may be drawn to museums through a series of strategies, such as designing exhibitions, using um, the language with which they are familiar and comfortable, and creating programs that will elicit pride in what they see. Finally, I would like to propose a more critical assessment as museum practitioners, for instance, my own practice, and uh, adapt a reflexive form of museology. So just to give you an outline of my discussion. So it's a background on the Bangsamoro and I will show maps and trade routes and to show you that uh, it's actually closer to Indonesia than you would imagine. And then I will show the language map and Filipino Muslims distinctiveness using language. There's also uh, the you know concern about what is the Bangsamoro basic law? And I'll ex uh, explain that. Um, the exhibition that we put together at the National Museum of Anthropology, uh, how we plan exhibitions at the National Museum 
Western Southern Regional Museum in Sambuanga City that is still part of the National Museum of the Philippines. And finally, uh, discussed sight, language, and representation and the imperative of reflexive museology. But before we begin, I'd like to actually emphasize um, the importance of, you know, to remind you about our um, concern for Ukraine. Uh, this is the, the historic center of Ukrainian port city of Odessa it has been designated as in, an endangered world heritage site by the United Nations Cultural Agency, uh, despite Russian opposition. The first image shows sandbags piled around the statue of the Duke de Resilu in Odessa in March 2022. Second image was taken during the general conference uh, of the International Council of Museums in August 2022, uh, pledging more support for Ukrainian colleagues. And you know, we should do what we can to help them uh, with their threatened heritage. Um, I also want to remind you that there is a new museum definition that can guide you in your practice. So I'm just reading it out that a museum is not for profit, permanent institution in the service of society that researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage. Open to the public, accessible and inclusive, museums foster diversity and sustainability. They operate and communicate ethically, professionally, and with the participation of communities offering varied experiences for education, enjoyment, reflection, and knowledge sharing. I was one of 20 um, museum uh, personnel who actually got involved with framing this museum definition. It wasn't easy because it was happening during you know, uh, the pandemic and the lockdown, but it's uh, very much data driven. And so it's, uh, we got all these uh, keywords from um, members of the International Council of Museums. So it was adopted on the 26th um, General Assembly in August 2022 in Prague, um, garnering 22.4% um, of votes. So it's pretty much a majority vote. Okay, so just to show you the map of the Philippines and in Asia and the Pacific, uh, where we are, we're very close to Indonesia and, and Borneo, Malaysian Borneo also. So um, the work of our, my colleagues at the National Museum of the Philippines have actually come up with this language map and settlement areas of the Moro groups in Southern Philippines and Palawan. So Mindanao, the Southern part of the Philippines and some parts of Palawan also cover the ancestral lands of both Muslim and non-Muslim indigenous peoples. Here's a map to show the location and distribution of the Muslim groups in Southern Philippines. So the purple areas um, show the provinces traditionally settled entirely by Muslim groups. Today, this is a separate geopolitical zone known as the Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao as defined by law. The gray areas are regions that are occupied both by Muslim and non-Muslim groups. White areas show the traditional settlements of non-Muslim groups, also called the Luman. Just to give you an idea that almost 98% of the Philippine population is Christian. So the Muslims are uh, considered a minority in the Philippines. So the, the, there is uh, also an ethno-linguistic maps that um, it was actually put together by the effort of the Ethnology Division of the National Museum of the Philippines. And you can see that it's quite bewildering because there's so many languages spoken in just a few, uh, you know, just the, the, the southern part of the Philippines. And I mean, that's, that's really to give you an idea of the complexity of what even putting together an exhibition could be uh, a challenge. So these are the, uh, you know, the, the Filipino Muslim groups. Um, 
So uh, there are a number of uh, them, um, and they're located in different parts of um, of uh, Mindanao, mostly in the southern part of Mindanao. So there is also um, a group uh, called the Lumad, who they are non-Muslims, and um, they are also found within the Mindanao area. And uh, just to show you that the trade routes, historical Asian trade routes, um, even during the Song and Yuan dynasties existed. And so uh, even prehistoric and pre-colonial times, um, the seas were navigated and, and strategic locations gave important transportation access for both local and foreign traders to Southeast Asia, uh, China, and even the South Pacific regions. Sulu alone, the very uh, southern tip, was significant trading entrepot for marine products because of its favorable locations within the trade routes between China, India, and the rest of Southeast Asia. So just to give you some images, this is uh, an old mosque built on the Tabawan coast in Tawi-Tawi. And then you would have from uh, a historical collection of the ethnology division, the seascape of Tawi Tawi. And like uh, in many parts of Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, Trepang trade was uh, very lucrative. So the, um, the Bangsa Moro is actually from the term Bangsa, meaning nation and Moro or Muslim in simpli simplified terms. Uh, it pertains to collective identity, uh, aspirations, and homeland of the Muslim in Mindanao, Philippines. Several aspects contribute to the development of the Bangsa Moro as a cultural and sociopolitical construct that is still being contested up to today. Accordingly, uh, a brief outline of the Islamization of Southern Philippines is crucial in understanding the complexity of the Bangsa Moro. And so um, I've actually given uh, a chapter of a book um, uh, in which I and uh, a young colleague, um, Cyril S Santos Sabio, wrote. Um, to, and I think it's going to be shared with you by Sandra so that. I don't have to focus too much on that. But just to give you this idea that the representation in photographs could also be quite misleading. And sometimes, um, you know, it's this exotic uh, view, you know, for instance, the focus on uh, a man with his many wives are always kind of like the main, main thing. So uh, this came from the Smithsonian. Um, collection. So uh, during the time of uh, the U.S. colonial um, government, the, the Department of Interior was established and then the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes. When Spain ceded the Philippines to the United States of America in 1898 under the Treaty of Paris, Mindanao was nearly unaware until the American soldiers moved to different sites of political and economic interest. It is a program that came from the Department of Interior through Secretary Dean Forster, who believed in the civilizing mission of their colonial government. Here he's posing next to a Negrito man, another uh, indigenous group in the Philippines, from the, another indigenous group in the Philippines, showing, you know, like his superiority in a way, he's six foot tall. You know. And so um, he then set up a special branch of the department, the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes, a zoologist by training and graduate of the University of Michigan. Worcester held the post from 1901 to 1913, appointed by the Philippine Commission headed by uh, William Howard Taft when he was still a judge and before becoming president in the U a US president in 1909. So these are photos of the Moro Constabulary and the Datu of Bayan. The Moro's uh, resistance, so the Moro comes from the term that it was a denigrating term used by the Spanish, the Moors. 
um, but was, it's now become like a part of their active identity formation and form of resistance. So the Moros resistance and negative attributes persisted until the American colonial period, wherein the Muslims of Mindanao were clustered into one region and were administered by the colonial government separately from the rest of the Philippines. Moro elites, however, struggled to negotiate with the colonial power in asserting that they were indeed a separate entity from the colonized and Christian Filipinos. Current mobilized Moro groups based their assertions for self-determination and self-autonomy from such historical evidence and their sultanate legacy. The, this assertion often led to armed conflict in Moro provinces that continue to this day. So just to give you a brief overview of the Bangsamoro basic law, it's a politicized concept. It's a, you know, a draft still, um, still being negotiated. And it's, uh, you know, refers to a separate political entity. So the definition basically is uh, that those who at the time of conquest and colonization were considered natives or regional inhabitants of Mindanao and the Sulu archipelago and its adjacent islands, including Palawan and their descendants, whether mixed or of full blood, shall have the right to identify themselves as Bangsamoro by ascription or self-ascription. Spouses and their descendants are classified as Bangsamoro. So you can you can appreciate the uh, challenge, you no, know, putting together an exhibition such as this. It is still in the National Museum of Anthropology in Manila. So in the exhibition, Faith, Tradition, and Place, Bangsamoro Art from the National Ethnographic Collection, material culture from Muslim areas in Southern Philippines is presented as signifiers of Islamic identity or its affiliation and as outcomes of interactions and negotiations with other Southeast Asian cultural traditions. It explores themes that bind together diverse materials from Islam, Islamized ethnic and indigenous groups in Mindanao, Sulu, Palawan, and the rest of Southern Philippines. The spread of Islam in Southern Philippines is demonstrated not as a one-way process, but rather as a complex and dynamic interplay of local connections and negotiations with influences from outside the community. What, what uh, Dr. Krebs mentioned about, you know, the different museologies that can be adopted to be able to put something like this together. So um, the focus on of the exhibition is the artistic heritage and art making traditions of the different Muslim uh, ethno-linguistic groups in Mindanao, Southern Philippines. The exhibition on Bangsamoro art categorizes objects collected from Bangsamoro areas in four sections. So it's Islam in Southern Philippines, the maritime trade networks, fast, fasting and feasting, communities and faith, art and food, and feasting and the flourishing of traditional art forms. Okay, so, um, but I would like to actually focus on um, the challenge of putting together textiles. So the curatorial team members from the National Ethnographic uh, the, um, Collection were uh, team members of the um, Ethnographic Division were hesitant to label the collection Bangsamoro because of its political tone. Further, several studies and literature reveal contentious premises surrounding its conception. On the other hand, labeling the collection Bangsamoro allows the National Museum to present developments in the meaning making of Islamic material culture in the collection. So it also enabled uh, us to actively engage with the contemporary stakeholders of the collection, given that certain provision in the proposed Bangsamoro basic law concerns the management and custodianship of Islamic cultural and artistic properties in the Philippines. So it's, um, 
also a challenge because physically um, textiles are very fragile. So we, we don't get a sense of how big this, these uh, textiles are, but I'll, I'll show one later on. So there are, were 10 groups um, uh, in Muslim Mindanao that were represented in the national collection through textiles, per, personal ornaments, weapons, uh, wood containers, brass implements, architectural decorations, religious paraphernalia, musical instruments, and other agricultural crafts, tools, and materials. So uh, quite interesting because uh, I want you to focus on this uh, particular piece of textile because it was really quite um, difficult to mount fragile items like this one. So um, one of the most difficult was really installing the rinukud or the canopy with the mosque design collected in 1977 by Omaira Kona in Lanao del Sur. The canopy was used previously as decorative hanging over the bed um, of a Maranao elite family. And it was quite big, 379 centimeters by 371 centimeters. It made a, uh, of, it is made of silk with central frame embroidered with the text that reads as Baisama Gindanao, a mosque complex and several zoomorphic botanical and cosmological designs. So what has happened is because it was so fragile, it's the canopy has become like a bed cover, which is, you know, needed, we needed to explain that to uh, visitors who would ask. Then also the programs of engaging the public. Um, so there have been a number of weaving demonstrations and le lecture series, particularly this one, uh, the Sama and Tawusu Tepo and Tutu uh, weaving demonstrations and lectures. So this um, is, uh, sorry. Uh, this first image, uh, Second image, sorry, is uh, the lecture of lawyer Salma Pir Rasul, uh, who talked about the Bangsamoro Basic Law, and she was with Sama Tepo Weaver, Nurfaida Dalimbang. And then this image weaving demonstration attracts young visitors to learn the art of tutup or food cover uh, by Tausug Jamija Kasim and Sia Muhammad. Um, while you know it's really quite attractive to have all these um, uh, public engagement, I've always felt a certain unease, and I'll explain later on why I'm un uneasy about about this. And then next uh, is a uh, this slide shows uh, weavers from Maranao and Maguindanao communities. Um, you would have, uh, you know, uh, um, the Marana weavers, um, Saadira, Basmala, Manawira, Manawira, Basmala, and Salika, Mangindanao. I think it's really very, very important to remember names. Um, usually in ethnographic museums, they would only have place or groups, but never the names and uh, photos of the women. And so, um, you know, there's also this display of their work and which, you know, they, in a way it's like um, during this particular uh, program, it seemed like they have their own exhibitions within the exhibition. So the anise really comes from the fact that we have to fly them over from Mindanao to go to Manila. And, you know, I've always thought, why not just go there and develop exhibitions and museums to help them preserve their heritage? So, um, which, you know, it's, it's a good way of introducing an exhibition that we've put together during the pandemic. Um, several lockdowns happened and uh, was really quite challenging. So the exhibition, this is just one of the exhibitions, but focusing on textiles, the Luhul, Landap, Inaul, and Tenu 
Um, so we've titled it Fabrics of Strength and Protection of the Bangsamoro because we were thinking about this luhul, which is the canopy that is like a form of protection. So uh, we pl planned and mounted this and other exhibitions in Sambuanga during the pandemic. We adapted them to the conditions, uh, including social distancing and the use of technology. Part of the strategy too is to make our displays better than those in Manila as part of our contribution to the healing, uh, you know, healing that we needed from the effects of COVID-19 and maintain well-being. The Luhul, the canopy featuring the tree of life of the Tao Suk, to show you some of the images of the exhibition. Um, so um, it, it's really quite a stunning uh, display because the material themselves, the textiles were really quite stunning. And this is the Luhul, uh, which is uh, symbolizes the tree of life for the Tao Su. And it's really a lot better than the one in Manila. And it's really amazing. Uh, I find this every time I, you know, when I saw this um, in in person, it's really quite, uh, quite it, it just takes my breath away every time. So what about making collections accessible? So with the richness of the national collections in the National Museum of the Philippines custody, it is important to go beyond the development of exhibitions we have done in Manila to practice equity and access. Employing technology and better display techniques, the National Museum in Sambuanga is a good example of making its public program visitor led. So this first image shows that, that you know, the primary languages used for, for labels and other texts are local ones. So we focused on what was spoken in Sambuanga City and nearby areas. So it's Chabacano, which is a Spanish Creole, and Cebuano, one of the Visayan languages. So Filipino, which is really uh, the national language, and English were in QR codes. You can see the QR codes. So just to show you how we apply the labeling technique for the Lepa or the Sama houseboat. So I'll just show you. Since 2012, I've really, I myself dreamed of suspending this houseboat, this real life houseboat from the ceiling to show to visitors what is it like in it, uh, you know, inside and to and display the other. 10 boats, life-size 10 boats, and the model ones, um, you know, with the, because to, to show the sophistication of the seafaring and boat building traditions among the Bangsamoro communities. So the images from four to seven is another reason for hanging the lepar, it, to be able to display the uh, complexities, uh, the richness of the Sulu Sea in which the Tubataha Reef a UNESCO World Heritage Site is located. It is also to show the material culture, sophistication of the Bangsamoro community's fishing techniques through nets and traps. So just to give you a brief background of where, where why we needed to put together a very uh, attractive exhibition. Um, so, Sometime in 2012, we managed to upgrade the facilities, including rebuilding a two-story building to adapt it to host exhibitions. We facilitated a consultation uh, through a three-day workshop in April 2014. We also, um, uh, there were still a lot of old exhibitions on seafaring, uh, fishing, and boat building among groups living around the Sambuanga city. But we also needed to consult with the stakeholders um, and found out that they wanted to show trade you know, in Port City and known as the only Latin city in Asia. So two new exhibitions opened on June 13, 2014 in time for the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day. I'm just showing you some of the images for that day. But you know, after two months, I mean, this is, part of the challenge. We had to dismantle the exhibitions due to 
termite infestation and took nearly five years to correct the issue. So, you know, it's it's probably your story too, no? you, this, this uh, frustration. But also I wanted to talk a little bit about the context of Port Pilar and how the exhibition that, that we put in there uh, recently had something to do with uh, this particular context. So it's known as the Royal Fort of Our Virgin Lady of the Pillar of uh, Saragossa. And so it's named after it. It, is, it was a, a Spanish uh, garrison in barracks uh, and was, I think, put together in, late, in the 17th century. Okay. But just to, to show you that the entire fortification is still very much in that and it's a national cultural treasure. And, um, you know, we had to make sure that the buildings were actually up to standard in terms of putting exhibitions inside. We had a bit of controversy because we had to rebuild this ruin and the local community did not like that. They preferred their ruin because they say that it's part of uh, the antiquity of the place. But we had to explain to them that if the ruin has something to do with you know, historical events, then that would be acceptable. But this became a ruin because of neglect of our predecessors and that cannot be enshrined in that way. So, you know, eventually they they prefer that these are the the workers that we hired to carry the lepa because we were going to display that in that particular building. And uh, recently they actually celebrated its 385th anniversary the fourth. So so just to you know to, to talk a little bit about the exhibition that um we put together in a way it's it's uh kind of having a sort of inversion no when whereas the the fort used to be a garrison a, a spanish bastion uh we wanted to bring in the bangsamoro uh material culture and it's in a way that 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 was a form of of inversion so i want to talk a little bit about periphery and center and this uh the last uh, two slides so the imperative of reflexive museology is really timely and now with the, you know, the new museum definition. But to show you that Manila is actually right there in the north, Luzon. And uh, Zamboanga City is right here. And so the, you know, the neglect that I was telling you about has something to do with that, that it's so far away that sometimes even uh, mu museum managers uh, forget about. And also because of the conflict around the area, there's a lot of peace and order challenges there. And sometimes I get my own ideas of what, um, what it's like to be in Bangsamoro areas through independent films like this one. So it's a, it was a, a film festival uh, of uh, LGBTQ uh, filmmakers, which is quite interesting. And to see the, the real situation in other parts of the areas. And in 2013, there was the Zamboanga siege and uh, also took a while for the city to recover. And sometimes some groups have not recovered. They, they're still in uh, places where, you know, they, they couldn't go back to their own villages. And one example is the Yakan village in, um, in Zamboanga City. Um, they have been here since the, since the 1970s, while you know, a lot of the uh, institutions around them you know, promote them for tourism, for selling all their very wonderful textiles. They are permanently in, uh, outside of where they came from, in, from Basilan, because of the problems during the 1970s. Uh, Zamboanga City also has um, the oldest mosque, you know, biggest mosque also in the southern, uh, western part of Mindanao. There's also like a, a, a water village. But, but I want to point out that 
in you know the museum that the National Museum um, is actually behind this um, that somehow this uh, Catholic shrine is actually on the periphery on the side so that's why it's quite it gives me some some ideas about putting the the periphery in the center because it's really quite interesting to see how inversions can happen. So thank you, Marami Salama, Terima Kasi. Um, this is me uh, with the Young Taos of Women. Um, and my, my only regret after stepping down as Deputy Director General Museums that I never was able to go to Sulu area of the 15 museums of outside of Manila. I, I wasn't able to go there and improve. So I always uh, think about Lanka Dahum um, and her, her struggles, her challenges in Sulu. So thank you so much. And uh, I want to acknowledge all these institutions and persons who really inspired me to put this together. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Anna. Uh, I would like to invite Christina Krebs and also Robert. So thank you, Christina, for your wonderful presentation. Yeah, I'm really yeah. appreciative of your work in advocating for a reframing you know, of the concept of museum using these indigenous models. I think you have shown us that within the local context, you know, we can find all signs of museology behaviors, such as the concept mm -hmm. of collection, the storage, preservation of both tangible and intangible cultural heritage, and even the idea of connoisseurship and appreciation mm -hmm. of its beauty and art. So mm -hmm. as Indonesian museums are developing, and I think in many ways we are looking to the West, you know, for models. Um, I think you remind us that we should upload these local mm -hmm. curation practices mm -hmm. rather than displace them. So I think the challenge is how to extend this local wisdom into the museum environment, right? While at the same time, you know, we need to incorporate new ways mm -hmm. of recording information, yeah. new methods of conservation, new ways to engage the audience that may be outside of the tradition themselves. So I have a question um, for you about how do you envision this merging of curation methodologies, you know, considering that the museum's audience is becoming more global mm -hmm. and even the new generations are becoming less connected to their own traditions. So mm -hmm. they are no longer sort of understood, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, immediately part of that tradition themselves. Mm -hmm. For me, okay. Um, thank you and thank you. Anna, for that really fascinating, informative <laughs> lecture first. Um, yes, I, I absolutely always want to stress that I, I think that the mixing <laughs> is critical and that I would never say that, um, you know, I don't think that professional museum methods are important. They are very important for, you know, especially conservation practices and using the technologies when you can have access to it. And so access is a critical component and, um, and how do we, you know, make knowledge as well as technology more accessible. But I think for me, it always comes back to um, the community and the museum being somehow, um, I mean, I, I know it's different in a, a Jakarta, maybe, but um, certainly in a, on a provincial level, um, something that I, you know, continue to, the last time I was in, in Indonesia was in 2014 for a conference called um, Museums of Our Own and making, you know, um, talking about local museologies and making them uh, a part of the community and part of people's lives. And so community involvement is really critical to sustaining not only the culture, but the, muse the museum and creating a museum culture. And, 
And so now I understand that things are not so top down. My vision was, you know, back in the Suharto era and when everything was top down and now it's much more democratic and from a bottom up perspective. And so I think that is, um, you know, is the community involvement component in the they're the curators and the people working in the museums are these mediators between the museum and the community and how to bring it together um, to make the resources of the museum more accessible uh, to the community at large. So it's bringing those worlds together and bridging um, any kind of gaps between the museum and the community. And so that's where engagement is so critical. And so I don't know if that <laughs> helps. Um, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, great, thanks, Christina. Um, uh, thank you also to Anna for these yeah great presentations. I really enjoyed them, and we've we've had a number of questions uh, put forth from the audience. But I'm going to be a little greedy and step in with one of my own questions first, if that's okay. Okay, um, and my question is for uh, Christina. Um, I was really interested in your uh, your kind of description of some of the indigenous curation practices, and a question I thought that is of interest to, to me as someone who is based in a Western museum and might also be interesting for people in non-Western museums to hear is, uh, could you share an example perhaps from your own work of how aspects of indigenous curation or museology have informed or have been incorporated into Western curatorial or museum practice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a really good example of that is um, as you know, uh, uh, you probably are very much aware of, of NAGPRA, the, the law, the Native Perfect. American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act in the United States, um, which was a law, oh, <laughs> to simplify it, uh, one of its requirements was for museums to make inventories of their collections and notify uh, Native American communities, tribes in the United States of those collections, but it required museums to consult, to actually sit down face-to-face <laughs> -face and consult with uh, tribal representatives um, to determine which um, item, ceremonial, sacred, as well as ancestral remains could be returned. So as a result of that, those consultations now and coll greater collaboration between museums and originating communities, we've learned how they, uh, people have their own, what they sometimes call traditional care methods and have been integrating them into the Smithsonian is oh. a good example. And, a, and our museum, as much as we can, every, every tribe has their own ways, has their own protocol for how to, to work with or treat or handle um, objects. And, you know, we've separated objects out from general collections that are sacred or ceremonial or should not be seen in the public, should not be on display. Um, all of these different uh, ways that people have tr traditionally, historically cared for um, their, um, and again, it's usually some kind of spiritual leader from the community that comes to consult, or, you know, we go to their communities to work with them. So that's an example of non-Western um, uh, Native American, in this case, methods being integrated into mainstream museums. And so um, I think that it's, I, ironic that that was that's something that we are now really working hard on in the United States to do but it was something that was very almost organic and natural in the Indonesian context 30 right. you know 25 years ago and but we've had to kind of unthink museology and mm. rethink it to be more inclusive of diverse perspectives and um you know we talked today a lot about diversity in museums, but we also need to think about diversity of our methods so that they are inclusive of mm. other people's ways of 
respecting and how they feel about, you know, especially, you know, trying to bridge this gap also between um, the sacred and the secular divide, especially in the Western Museum world. And there was a lot of resistance to NAGPRA uh, by members of the scientific community mm -hmm. who saw conflict, you know, in, in those bringing religion, what they said, re they're, by respecting people's spiritual beliefs, you're bringing religion into the museum. And so I think uh, uh, some things that Anna was saying, very interesting about how do you represent Islam? You know, how do you represent any religion in the museum? And I know in Indonesia, that's that's a important question too, you know, because of religious diversity and something that people in Museum Belonga were asked also, well, why is the museum just about Dayak religion? <laughs> So it gets into all of those kinds of things. I, I don't know if that answers. Yeah, great. Question. Robert, thank you. Yeah, thanks good, very much. Good, good question. Thanks. That, that really makes me think a, a lot about the some of these practices that I do see around, for example, the Smithsonian and how we're changing our methodologies, um, thinking about them in light of the example, for example, that you talked about uh, with the Basir and respecting the, you know, the um, the voices of the people who oftentimes for for whom these objects mean the most. Um, thank you very much. I think, yeah, if I can ask one more question, this time for Anna, this leads right, I think, quite nicely into this. At, at the tail end of your talk, I was quite interested in your um, description of the importance of reflexive uh, um, museology. And I was wondering um, if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you meant by that. Hmm. <clears throat> Actually, I'm, even even my own practice, I'm I'm reviewing it because I have um, I have now the time to to think th things through. Um, it's it's this really this notion of developing systems to be able to incorporate this multiplicity of voices, um, mm. and and it, it and and we don't have that system, I think, not yet, and uh, that's why I think uh, even my own personal projects are also uh, works in progress um, because we need to think about, you know, we feel very privileged because we're in museums and we, we're like gatekeepers. Um, and then, so we have to think, what have we excluded? What, what particular areas have we not managed to represent? Um, even some of the methodologies, you know, we, we follow um, in Southeast Asia, we follow all these very Western practices, like for instance, um, even conservation. And, but then we go to like the regional museums and we find that it's insensitive, you know, the, the, the practice can be quite insensitive. So I think we, oh. we just have to really, you know, kind of start thinking about what we're doing. And, and how that sort of excludes other groups. Um, because I think it's far more, I think, um, worthwhile to bring other people in. And I think the pandemic has also taught us to develop that kind of sensitivity too. You know, it's because we, we need all these spaces to, to heal in, in that way. Um, we can't go back to what we what it was like before, you know, when we think about numbers and competitions and you know, we, we have to start working together. Mm. And that's, that's the kind of reflexivity that I was thinking of. Yeah. Wonderful. So if I can Thank follow you. Up, Anna. Mm. Thank you. Um, so in your work, is it very challenging to interest the majority community in the Philippines in a Muslim minority culture? Yes, I think people have, I mean, I, I think for most of you who work with communities, it's not easy. It's quite tedious. Um, you know, there are sometimes even some infighting. I, I now am based in New York and have worked, started to work with Filipino American communities. And that in itself has mm -hmm. its own challenges um, because they have very specific views and sometimes even cultural baggages uh, with them, um, you know, and 
And so it's it's that it, it's I think a gift to listen um, basically, <laughs> and then um, to develop you know the kind of programs that they might want, but to also give them a kind of framework um, so that you know they have some anchors how to do it better and work together. You know, it's it's, it's it it's it is very very challenging i think and and you would agree with me and and i think the other participants would also uh, be aware of that uh, that it's it's not easy but i think it's worthwhile yeah. well, there is a, another question uh, for anna about the the labeling and the qr yes. code which yes. is from um prinka saraswati from gianyar bali textile archivist so the last time they curated an exhibition, um, they were considering what to, language to put first, Balinese, Indonesian, and English. So what do you suggest? It's, uh, you know, to, I mean, it's, it's, it comes from, from talking with the stakeholders, uh, the people you want to direct the, the program for. Um, and, and that's where, where you should, that should be your basis for, what kind of language you want to adopt, and and it's not just the um, you know kind of semantics or or linguistics, but it's also again access. What what kind of language would you uh, would you adopt in terms of the level of information that you're going to share? Um, you know, the best thing is really not to think in terms of specialist knowledge. Don't assume that people know what you're talking about, but at the same time, not to patronize, you know? So it's a, a very delicate um, kind of um, way of putting that together. And, and that's why I've always uh, pleaded with people to really take the text seriously and not just to hurry it up. And, and also the translation can, you know, things can be lost in translation and can be, um, can be, you know, it can get offended. And that's why you need to consult. And after you write down text, you should share it with people who, you know, it's almost worthwhile to get kind of like um, uh, advisory board from the community so that, you know, becomes also a, a rewarding and humbling experience because that also shows that you're not the only expert. You just have the 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 facility, but it's it's they're they're the expert eventually. Now we have a question here um, from a member of the audience. If I can put this for uh, this is for Dr. Krebs. Uh, it comes from Fikar, who is based in the Presidential Museum in Bogor, Indonesia. Uh, his question is: How is a curator to determine the best way to interpret the different potential meanings of a collection. Uh, the example he provides is how the same ornaments or objects sometimes have different meanings among various tribes. Yeah, that that has come up a lot in um, my own work, you know, with, with Native Americans and, and um, Again, it it's like the language question of how which language do you privilege and and um, it is that issue of do you generalize for the sake of of creating this kind of general category of things that Western museology has always done at the disservice of of cultural particularity and diversity and so. Again, it might go back to the, like Anna just mentioned, um, having some kind of advisory group, uh, community advisory group, in which people come to some kind of agreement or understanding, or you try to give as many interpretations as you can and make it clear that there is no one way of um to find that even in um for in, in anthropology uh you we talk a lot about how in the past when there was such a focus just on the functional 
you know, the function of an object of material culture, when, you know, there's all these other dimensions. And now we're much more attuned to intangible cultural aspect of something as well as it's tangible. And so there, there are so many different ways of interpreting and knowing and being in relationship to something. So it, it is a matter of, of um, working that out. If there are people who are still around who know something about it, and if not, then try try to communicate um, that there's usually no one way <laughs> mm. of, of knowing or interpreting something that in some with some people this is what this is and this is what this means but with other people it could mean something else and just by saying that you you communicate there's no one truth about something mm. <laughs> so i don't know it's it is it is a challenge it is a challenge certainly thank you we uh we do have a question for the for the panel more widely um this is from michael gonzalez he asks how would the panel consider curatorship uh particularly access and display of expatriated collections in western museums for ethnic communities in a diaspora how can western museums include these communities how are community experts included in this process in these processes and institutions perhaps anna could i put that to you um okay um i think it's a matter of also making yourselves known to the museums uh in your neighborhood <laughs> and uh, let them um, be aware that this is something that you would like uh, to happen or your, your community group would you like to happen. Um, it's, it's really an argument against like um, objects that are in their collection that, you know, there, there's no active demand for repatriation because, you know, especially with, with Filipino American groups, that are in the diaspora. It's um, it's really interesting because they can actually um, make use of those objects and reinterpret them in the way that can actually have meaning uh, to them. I mean, so that the project that um, I'm I'm uh, part of in the University of Michigan, um, I'm I'm just really at, at the advisory board level, is is really something to look you know. You can help by looking at, for instance, some of the labels that may have been, you know, that that may have been kind of become really more hurtful at their at the level, the contemporary level. No, um, you can see, for instance, that because of certain colonial discourse, uh, you know, you have all these images, for instance, of Worcester at the University of Michigan. Um, it, it has to be reinterpreted in that way. It's not just a matter of, I think you're, that, that's the um, misunderstanding of curation. It's not just about putting together exhibitions, but really to look into the collections and, um, and you know, make it more meaningful for, for you. If there are certain things that are offensive, then, then you know, call it out. And that's why I think there's been um, some examples already. For instance, the Field Museum in Chicago has a, a co-curation project uh, mm. with the Filipino American community. And I think that's, that's a really good start. Um, and, and because that could later on inform a more sensitive uh, exhibition or public programs for, for the community so that it could you know, especially the younger generation could could actually appreciate what uh, you know heritage they have in the museum just next to where they are. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Do you want to say the last word? Because I think we have to close after this remark. You're I, muted. 
I just put uh, something in the chat that just as, as an example, um, Paul Basu in the, the UK, I don't know if anyone knows him, has done a lot of really interesting work on this in um, with uh, people from Sierra Leone or both in country and out of country with um, objects in UK museums and how those objects are serve as kind of ambassadors um, for people in the UK um, on the part of people from Sierra Leone and the, the communities living in in the UK now. So just as a reference, that's that's a kind of an interesting work that and he wrote an article called Diasporic Objects. And it's very much about object biographies and recon and, and following those biographies and retracing and, and for the reconnecting uh, communities with objects in and outside of the country. <laughs> so um that I just thought of his his work when I I saw the question. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Um I think we have reached the end of the hour. So I want to say thank you very much again to mm -hmm. our speakers, Christina Krabs and Anna Labrador. Mm -hmm. I yes. think you have provided you. us with further reflection mm -hmm. about different type of museologies and culturally sensitive curation approaches. Mm -hmm. And I also want to um, say that, uh, you know, the, our translator, Anna Rahmawati, I think mm -hmm. deserve a big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> thank <laughs> you. It's not very easy to do. Um, yeah, yeah. So on behalf of the Tracing Patterns Foundation and our co-host, the American Institute of Indonesian Study, AVIS, and also our other partners, Museum Cheria, Institute Conservasi, and Smithsonian Institution's Asian Culture History Program. We want also to thank the U.S. Embassy Jakarta for providing the funding for the M21 program. And then also to all of you who participated in this webinar today. Mm -hmm. So once again, thank you. and.